Harwood. Um, so I've done a little bit of digging around and I've discovered. Ricky Grove. Fog comes in on little cat feet. <laughs> Phil Rice, this is the best film that I've seen all year and maybe ever. Damien Valentine, use the machinima, Luke. Hello and welcome to And Now for Something Completely Machinima, the podcast about machinima, virtual production, and other technologies. I'm here. Uh, my name is Phil Rice, and I'm here with my co-hosts, Damian Valentine and Tracy Harwood. Ricky is off uh, scaling the Himalayas, but he will be back uh, in a couple more episodes or so. So uh, this this episode, we're going to be uh, kind of catching up on some news that's out there. Um, and I'll kick things off. I think we've mentioned this video on a previous episode, there basically there someone has created a video that's titled "Learn Unreal Engine Five by Making a Short Film in Under Sixty Minutes." And I'm not particularly ambitious or in a hurry to learn Unreal Engine Five, but I've had it downloaded for a while. And as Damien and I were discussing uh, a week or so ago, uh, I've kind of been trying to decide. From my iClone productions, should I lean towards Omniverse or should I go the way Ben Tuttle has gone and do it more in Unreal Engine? And maybe I need to learn to do both. And with Unreal Engine 5, I've been intimidated by it, uh, even though I'm probably what people would term as as experienced uh, with Machinima generally. I've done it with games. I've done it with MovieStorm. And now I've been doing it with iClone. But Unreal Engine 5 really struck me as there's so much I'm going to have to just learn all over again. And it, it concerned me and, and has legitimately kind of kept me away from really doing much there. Uh, I'm happy to say that this video uh, that I've referred to, which we'll link to in the show notes, has completely changed my, my point of view on that. Uh, I'm not intimidated by Unreal Engine, and this video is responsible for that. I followed it through almost in real time, like barely pausing and was able to digest and retain uh, information from this video to where I feel like I could fire up Unreal Engine 5 now and make a pretty decent go of it. Now, obviously, there's lots of levels of detail. There's more advanced features that this doesn't even, this video doesn't even pretend to cover, but it is an excellent tutorial, just excellent. And uh, it, it holds true to the promise of its title. Now, the caveat, if there is one, is that I'm not sure how to imagine what it would be like watching this video if I didn't have the background that I do. Meaning, stuff like moving stuff around in blender or an iclone you know manipulating and resizing and rotating objects and that whole paradigm of 3d software which is common to well now the modern blender it's common to iclone it's common to a lot of the other 3d softwares uh i have a lot of experience with that if i didn't that'd be that you would have to add that to the list of things i would have to be able to grasp and learn while watching this video I'm not sure how that would go. I'm familiar with frame animation, how it generally works. You know, IK and, and the different types of animations and how things are interpolated. And, you know, that wasn't new to me watching this. So that's, I guess I'll express, there's a little bit of caution there that if you're completely new to working in 3D software, you may have to watch this a few times. But the good thing is, is that all of that information is in this video all those fundamentals of how to navigate around how to manipulate objects and bring them in and, and change them and stuff it's all in this video but he goes through it quite quickly like there's an expectation there that you you're not completely unfamiliar with this stuff so technically it, let's say you've only made machinima in the sims or only made it in in well even if you've made it in second life the way of moving and manipulating objects in Second Life is not that different from 3D software. 
Um, but if you've only done it in games, for example, then maybe plan on watching this a few times. Um, and if you've got a dual monitor setup, that's ideal because you open this video up on one screen and you have the stuff that he's opening in, in Unreal Engine on the other and pause that video as much as you need to or rewind or whatever. But it is it is excellent. It's very accurate. It's very thorough. He doesn't waste time on details that you don't need when you're starting. Uh, it's just, it's it's maybe the perfect tutorial for Unreal Engine that I've ever seen uh, for complete beginners. So um, yeah, it's, it's great. Uh, Ricky is who uh, drew my attention to this video and I bookmarked it at that point and finally got around to watching it this week. And it's terrific. It's really terrific. So if you've been wanting to wet your toe in Unreal Engine, this this video can help kind of fill in some gaps for you or maybe even get you started, you know, from the beginning. So, yeah, that's that's my news item for this week. Tracy, my understanding is you've got uh, a handful uh, of items for us. Well, I've got a few. Yeah, I mean, I have got a few. Um, let me start. OK, so this is something I, I would sort of say puts fan communities under a little bit of pressure. Now, you'll remember, well, if you've been following us, you'll remember that um, last month uh, we mentioned that Valve's new Steam policy meant that um, there was a large number of AI games that would now be released, which I thought was really exciting news. This month, however, I have to say I'm pretty disappointed to see that Valve is actually getting tough with its modding fan communities, resulting in folks behind... Um, the Team Fortress VR mod to be pulled. Um, now, I understand it. The problem here is that the mods are using some of Nintendo's proprietary IP to get them to run, meaning that Valve is taking, uh, taking well, I, th I guess, some kind of indirect or maybe preemptive action on behalf of, of Nintendo. Um, and that issue is also impacting Portal fans, and in turn, it seems to also be impacting the Half-Life community of modders too. Uh, I think it's really disappointing all round um, because, of course, fans are the key ones behind some of the most exciting projects, such as um, the Team Fortress Source 2, um, which uh, was attempting to bring multiplayer back to life in its sandbox engine. And also Portal 64, which was attempting to make Portal run on the on the Nintendo. Um, all pulled. We've often said we've rarely um, seen much machinima made with hand controllers. And in fact, I think it was Damien, you highlighted this last month. There's now more growth with PC games than there are in, in uh, controller-based um, uh, uh, sales, if you like, kit sales. Um so I would think maybe what we're seeing here is a bit of a shot in the foot for Valve's Nintendo games, um, if I'm honest. Um, now, Valve has always been very supportive of its fan communities. Um, so I think it's going to be quite interesting to see what the impact of this might be on the Machinima community directly. Um, and in relation to Valve support, you only have to look at fan-made uh, entirely free game mods, um, which run on Half-Life 2, for example. Um, the you know the the colloquial colloquially called Half Life Three or Entropy Zero, which was launched in 2017, and its sequel, which launched uh, in uh, 2023 last year, called Entropy Zero Two. Now I now I mentioned that because uh, last week we reviewed um, a feature length uh, machinima called Amesis Blue. Um, which was quite an astonishing film in, in so many ways, uh, made by Fortress Films, obviously using Team Fortress assets, but their latest film has become a major promo for Entropy Zero Two, and it's equally stunning work. Um, I don't believe there's any actions being taken by Valve against the mod itself. Um, to be honest, I think if there were, the knock-on impact would see yet another fan community make a really... Um, major move, more strategic move, I think, across to tools like Unreal to make um, fan movies um, rather than attempt to use Source Filmmaker, which has already lost a lot of ground because of the competition from such as iPhone and Unreal. Um, so if all of that, you know, if they really hit those fan communities harder, I, I my guess is Source Filmmaker may as well not, may as well not exist really. 
Um, so yeah, disappointing news there from from um, a couple of Valve uh, take takedown notices, basically. On the other side of things, there's two uh, new movie making tool sets which have been released. Now, this is quite interesting that we're seeing more games um, come to the fore that focus on machinima creators, specifically playing with the movie ma- movie. Start that again. Movie making process. Now, we first mentioned the first one I want to talk about, um, Blockbuster Inc. Um, actually. Uh, it was teased last summer, uh, and that's when we talked about it. Now, they've just released the prologue version of it on Steam. I think it's free. Um, and I've got to say thanks to Evan Ryan for bringing it to our attention. I quite like one of the reviews for it. It says the best parts, uh, It's a, it's it includes basically the best part of the movies with the out. <laughs> without the alcoholism uh, and filling your lots with various celebrity trailers. Um, I think when we first mentioned it, we felt it maybe sat somewhere between movie storm and the movies. Um, but I guess over time, let's see what others um, think about it. I found a bit of a demo for it, um, which I'll put in the, in the show notes. Um, another one uh, that is worth highlighting is called Replicant. And thanks to John McInnes for highlighting this one. This is actually also in free beta as well. And it's made uh, uh, in the Unreal Engine. And you can pick it up on the marketplace. And this is a game where you can simulate a virtual production platform for movie making, which seems to me to sit somewhere between the movies, movie storm and actually the Sims as well. Now, Replicant has got a YouTube channel. You might have seen it um, uh, around a bit. It's it's quite cartoony with the animations that it enables you to create. There's a stack load of tutorials on how to, to do it. Um, and I'll put um, the demo reel, if you like, on the, the show notes as well. So those are, those are two that I thought were really quite worth having a, a look at. I don't really think Movie Storm figures in this somehow. It seems to be more a game about rather than a tool set for, but I, but I could be wrong. Then the other thing that I wanted to just sort of mention, you know, we, we said we'd follow what's going on with, with steam steamboat, Willie, um, Disney's Mickey IP. Um, well, <laughs> I found a Minecraft steamboat, Willie, which is quite a fun <laughs> take on it, which has been made uh, by uh, a team called red and blue, not red, versus blue but red and blue it's just the first little bit of it but it's it's pretty good gotta say gotta watch it uh and then i also found what has been called an official trailer or official teaser by future studios made in unreal engine called the return of steamboat willie and it's it's you know it's playing on this kind of horror creepy um film that's supposed to be uh coming our way anytime soon or whenever um, it's super creepy, I have to say, and it's quite impressive. Uh, it's very well filmed. Um, turns out that CEO of the studio, um, about which you can actually find very little, you can't really find anything much about future studios at all. But its CEO is one guy called Kai Henry. Um, and he's previously managed folks like Snoop Dogg, Ice Cube, Quincy Jones, and also founded a lifestyle YouTube um, platform called Ski TV. It's fair to say he's um, quite professional in the way he goes about things. So it's not really very surprising, ultimately, that it's actually a pretty good teaser for this um, uh, film. Or maybe it's just a standalone teaser. I, I, I don't know what the connection is between Future Studios and the new horror movie. But anyway, watch it. It's pretty good. The other thing that I found, which I'm sure you'll love... Um, is, uh, well, in relation to scary things, a BBC documentary, a really short one, four minutes long, about the origins and the impact of the Wilhelm scream. Now, we've talked about that quite a few times on the on the, on the show um, in various machine events that we, we've watched over the years. Um, I'll put a link um, in the show notes. I'm not sure if you can watch BBC um, iPlayer stuff wherever you are in the world. I don't think you can, but um, hopefully you can. I know Ricky has in the past. Um, I was kind of really interested to see yeah, what it's, it's, it's weird. There's, there's some stuff that's region, region limited and there's some stuff that's not. 
Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, I hope it's not because I'm sure you'll enjoy this. It's a real, it's a real quick and dirty overview. Like I said, I was really interested to see what it had been in, which is everything from things like Reservoir Dogs to Lord of the Rivet. Lord of the Rings, and also every single Indiana Jones and Star Wars movie, um, as well as things like Monsters University and literally hundreds of others. It was first heard, apparently. Do you know when it was first heard, Phil? I don't. I'm sure Ricky does, but I, I oh. don't remember. Damien? No, I, I've got no idea. No idea. Right. Nine, well, it's well before our time, of course. Gary Cooper's 1951 classic called Distant Drums. That's when it was first heard. But actually, it only gained its name <clears throat> in the 1953 <clears throat> film called The Charge at Feature, Riv Feature River. Uh, yeah, The Charge at Feature River. Um, when a horse soldier, apparently called Bri Private Wilhelm, was shot in the leg. And do you know who it was voiced by? testing you do you know no 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 the guy <laughs> no. Is a, well he was actually a singer songwriter actor and comedian no. his name was shelby woolley um which is uh you know he's he was he was brilliant when you look at his portfolio of huh. stuff um sheb woolley Anyway, I'll put a link up and you'll 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 see for yourself. I think you'll you'll find it really interesting because there's a bit more to it than um we'd actually assumed, I think. And then the last thing that I wanted to highlight this month um is yet another new generative AI that's actually not being released but is being teased. Um I'm not actually sure when this one will be released. I have heard hints that it might be the end of March. Um, but we'll see. This one's called Sora. Um, and it's text to video um, by OpenAI. Now, there's, you know, a, a, what, 20 or so um, videos um, flying around the Internet, millions of views. It's incredibly impressive um, because of the way it not only produces photorealistic quality film in slightly longer format than we've seen, say, from Runway or others, um, which is about a minute in length but also because it includes physical properties, physics properties, um, for those things that are in the scene, such as um, rain falling or, uh, you know, traffic moving or water flowing or clothing moving, those kinds of things, all quite um, integrated into, to, into what you're seeing. So the physical properties is the, the key uh, component that we're looking at here have to say it's got quite a few of the big boys really twitchy. Uh, I mean, everything seems to uh, make people twitchy these days. But I did see one studio boss commenting that he's actually delaying building a new studio until he figures out how this is going to impact on filmmaking. Uh, and someone else that I saw commenting quite, quite senior in the industry reckon that there would be over 200,000 jobs that are likely to be at risk when this kind of tool comes out. have to say, um, probably the main interest in this is going to be in scenery and background, or at least from what I understand at the moment, because you, the, you know, once you can start feeding video to video into this, then potentially what you've got is the, the way that you can use, use this tool to sort of um, look at other scenes uh, or the same assets, but from other views within the scene playing out over video. So it's, I think, potentially a very sophisticated tool, although that's not what is being demoed at this moment in time. Um, so, yeah, the other thing I will say, I think, is this 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 is probably not as straightforward as we might imagine it will be. And part of the reason for that is obviously the the process of prompting. Um, you know, we've 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 all sort of had a go at doing image prompting from from text over the last sort of eighteen months or so. Um, but now, if you imagine what we're looking at with this kind of thing, you're not just talking about creating the image. You're also now going to have to think about what the language of movement is. And not just for one thing, but for multiple different aspects of scene components. And if you're talking about, you know, a, a minute long film, also the durational 
aspect of that as well. That is just not going to be easy. It's not, it's, you know, that's, that's a whole kind of craft in itself. I don't see anybody really being able to pick that up instantly and craft with this in the way that, you know, maybe you could compose an image reasonably quickly. Um, and in many ways, I, you know, somebody asked me uh, what I thought about it a, a couple of weeks ago when I, when I happened to be with some, some, well, one of the major tech companies. And I, I basically said it reminded me very much of the machinima community when they first sort of started picking up a game engine and looking at it as a tool set. And that machinima community, when they had inside knowledge of how that game worked, were the only ones really that could craft something new and novel out of it. But they had to know the game inside out to do it. And to my way of thinking, what you're looking at here is very similar. You're going to have to know how to craft something with a deep knowledge of how this tool works. And nobody knows that at this moment in time. I don't think it will ever be that easy because of the way that it will continually evolve and update. Um, so, yeah, great, really interesting tool set and whatnot. I think it's far from clear how people will use it and integrate it into their kind of um, workflow. It's also worth saying something that um, about a couple of weeks before this came out, I saw Runway release was also really interesting, which is this ability to create components within the image and, you know, you use them and take control over them so that you can uh, move that part of the animation with the rest of the animation going on around it. Um, I think the, um, the promotion for that has probably gotten lost in all the hype about Sora which I do think is a bit of a pity. So I will put a link again in the show notes to what Runway have done with this kind of um, control mechanism that they've um, they've generated. There is one sort of thing that I'll, 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 I'll mention um, in relation to workflow and learning the craft and, the, and content production and what have you. Uh, Next week or in a couple of weeks time, you'll see us review a film called Flight. Um, and in that, what you are looking at is Unreal Engine being used with um, CG effects and real acting. Um, and those things are being blended together almost in a real time way uh, to create a quite a sophisticated looking short film using a, propri a proprietary um, platform, um, which the uh, film director has, has created based on Unreal Engine. We'll talk about that a bit more um, when we review that film. Um, but that's an example, I think, of the kind of workflow and pipeline that needs to be thought through integrating these kind of generative AIs. And we're not anywhere near developing those kind of pipelines at this moment in time. Uh, with possibly that exception. Um, so, yeah, that's that's uh, me. Oh, no, I've got one more thing I wanted to mention. The Suno model, Eleven Labs has re released a new Suno AI model, which is great for music composition. I actually did find a really um, fun example of uh, a rap that had been um, created, which I'll share a link to as well. That's me, me done on my news updates. Hello. A lot of a lot of interesting stuff happening there. Um <clears throat> yeah, Valve getting back to the to the top of the list there. Uh Valve sure isn't a company that sh <laughs> that shies away from having some drama, are they? I mean, it's it's been uh it's been a really interesting journey for them over the years, you know. Uh, yeah. uh I, I kind of feel like that there's I've always thought about them having a little bit of parallel to Hugh Hancock when he founded Machinima.com. I feel like Valve, and ultimately, has that has become the that is the way that games are distributed. I mean, of course, there are competitors, but I mean they've they've far and away got the big market share there. So now they're this platform for distributing games and regulating what games are allowed and all this other 
these layers of complexity and the legalities and you know compensation and royalties and all that stuff from a company that essentially was a they just liked making games you know and i feel like in some ways there's a parallel between their decision to do that and hugh's decision who hugh was a filmmaker he loved making movies that's what he wanted to do but he he realized that there was a lack of platform uh in 1999 or whatever it was that they launched that 1999 2000 and so he devoted just tons and tons of his energy to creating and then maintaining this website machinima.com uh for those of you who are, aren't familiar with that time period it's before it was the youtube channel and the big corporate thing it was just run by hugh and some some people he knew and and uh was a private endeavor they coded it the whole website from scratch. Uh, this was before the days of WordPress or CMS platforms that were really big. They just did it themselves. Uh, partly because uh, there weren't a whole lot of options that in that regard, but also because Hugh had a devotion to the idea of, you know, kind of the the, the free software foundation, the the creative commons aspect and all that. He was very philosophically invested in that idea. And so the idea of if we're going to build this site, we're not going to build it on something proprietary that anybody could ever, you know, uh, disrupt or, or tell us what to do mm -hmm. kind of thing. Uh, he was a major thought leader in that regard, I feel like. But anyway, at some point, he just said, you know, I can't keep doing this if I'm going to be able to make films. There's just not enough time in a day or in a life. And he was faithfully right about that, you know? Mm. Um, so in, and to a degree, I wonder how much of some of this drama that goes on with Valve and, uh, you know, the, the, the whole huge delay on finishing the Half-Life <laughs> story arc in video games. And how much of that is, well, they chose to take on a pretty big freaking distraction when they decided we're going to become the leading distribution platform for games. And at one point they, I don't even know if they dropped this or followed through on it, but they were going to release their own hardware. Oh, yeah, they're still doing that. They got um, the steam deck. Yeah. It's yes. not. Yes. Yeah. The steam deck that, that was, we saw that develop over a, a period of a decade before it was ready to come to market. And, and then they got into VR hardware themselves and are a big, a big player in that space as well. So it's like I don't I don't envy whoever has to uh to run that place. It's kind of a behemoth now. They've they've got their fingers in a lot of pies, as they say. So uh and then now, yeah, they're actually there's someone who used to work for Valve in the uh design and development department that I saw on Twitter the other day recently got rehired. It's kind of a big name. I won't mention it on here, but uh that that would tend to imply that something maybe is starting to happen for something in the mm. game making, but who, who knows, you know? So, and then now they've got where they're clamping down on potentially clamping down on some mod stuff. And all of that seems to have to do with guarding their intellectual property, which means maybe they are going to do something with the half-life story. There was talk years ago of maybe they'll make it into a movie and, talk about the movie rights and there was a discussion and just boy oh boy man mm -hmm. what a what a what a hot mess <laughs> and, and and you know and you know I, i'm not saying that all the new steam is a great plot the half-life and portal games and other things that are built on that platform uh, Left for Dead, and I mean this whole series of of games that are using that tech mm -hmm. uh, are undeniably popular games. Counter Strike and Team Fortress and that whole family of games. Uh, it's amazing, yeah. Yeah. but it's also it must be a, a massive headache for whoever's at the top of that. So, well, for the Steam Deck, uh, I actually got one. It's a great little device. Well, I say yeah. little, it's very heavy. Um, <laughs> yeah, but. <laughs> they're, they're they're already working on the Steam Deck too, and obviously that's several years away. But when the first one was released, one of the big thought points was they made sure, sure all of their games were compatible with it. So Half Life, Left 4 Dead, Portal, um, 
and the various sequels and spin-offs of those games, they all had to be compatible with it. And it, they were. And they even made a sort of spin-off portal game as the tutorial to how to use the, the Steam Deck. Oh, wow. It, it doesn't add anything to the story. It's just you wake up in the in the uh, laboratory and you have to... Right. One of the AIs is giving you the guide and, you know. Um, so if they are working on the Steam Deck too, well, they've already got their old games working, so they'll probably want to have something to release alongside the Steam Deck too, to say, look, this is a good reason to buy the new device. I don't sure. think they'd make a new game exclusive to the Steam Deck too, because that would be bad business for people who don't want the Steam Deck. And then obviously there's a lot of PC gamers who don't want it or don't need it. Mm. Um, so they're not going to restrict that, but it would be a good selling point to have uh, a new portal or a new half-life game to go alongside the new hardware when it eventually gets released mm. well and and i think they've got reason to think that that's a good idea with with uh the the acclaim uh that half-life alex has received which was was basically to to kind of you know extend their game world into the world of vr and uh i mean the reviews on that are fantastic and uh, my son's someone who who played it and he's dabbled a lot with vr stuff and says far and away it's the best vr experience he's ever had mm. so uh yeah i i wish them well for sure it just it as as someone who also when i'm not having fun making movies and talking about movies i i run a business i i just can't imagine the headaches that go along with the business side of 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 an enterprise like that and you know it's very easy to cast them as the bad guy when they're having to do this stuff to protect their story but you know but at the same time that is probably one of their most valuable properties mm. is that very ethereal intellectual property that is the half-life world and if they finally decided to actually really move forward with that story in an additional way i'm like mixed like i i feel bad for the modders but also i'm like excited because okay yeah. they've never not really they've never not delivered like once they decide to do it that's the, that's the hard part <laughs> there's a lot of hemming and hawing and oh we may do it, we may not, and a lot of rumors and they've got that when when it's done development mentality so you never really know what's going to when they do put something out it's good, yeah. you know. So it's hard to so not get excited about that a little bit. A Star Wars um, author said, because um, when before Disney bought Star Wars, there was obviously lots of tie-in video games and novels and comics and all that kind of stuff. And when Disney bought it, one of the first things they did was all this extra content isn't going to be something we think about when we tell our new stories. They kind of set it aside. You can still buy it, but they're not. They're just kind of ignoring it. And so someone asked one of the major contributors, one of the authors, I think he wrote about nine different novels across many years, uh, what he thought about it. And he said, when you're born into write for something like Star Wars, you're playing with someone else's toys. So if they want to pack those hmm. toys away, you can't really say anything about it because they were letting you play with it as a kindness, but you know, they ultimately it belongs to them. The, and that's the age-old yeah. machinima story, isn't with it? This... From the very earliest yeah. days, that's always been, yeah, the 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 risk, I guess. Yeah, and it's the same with modding yeah. as well. In you're playing with someone else's engine, but if they want to say, you know, that's enough. Yeah, it's unfortunate, but mm. yeah, it is, I don't it is buy the that it's... though. Yeah. You know, because games are just a bunch of code without the player, and without the machinima creators. There aren't really very many interesting stories other than the advertising stories. So, you know, the, it's 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 uh, a partnership. If, if yeah, you put it like that. Uh, I think each of these communities have a role to play, and uh, the the modding community is the kind of it's always been the hidden community. I think in terms of the the creative practice side of it but they're just as important as the machinima creators are as the game devs are as the fan communities are each has a role to play here and i think you take one of those away and you start losing the rest in in, yeah. in my opinion it's um it's more it's it becomes more than the sum of the parts and each part is equally important they would do well to remember that 
Yes. So the other thing I wanted to talk about without getting too long into it, but what is the Steamboat Willie <laughs> obsession? You know, yes. I, I mean, just to, to to not assume anything about what people know. So, you know, Steamboat Willie is this iconic version of Mickey Mouse from the early days. And basically that that movie or the IP surrounding that early version has recently gone into the public domain. And so there's been this big surge of people kind of wanting to uh, repurpose that character. And a lot of the choices of how to do so have been, uh, let's say, of darker persuasion, right? Yeah. Um, very much recontextualizing this little, for, for, for decades, for almost a century, this little thought to be lovable character and now there's all this sense of uh, wanting to kind of pounce on that and turn him into a monster or whatever uh i mean what is that it's like i mean i i know that there's an easy answer to that and maybe that's all it is 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 it a reflection of Disney, a once loved company, Walt Disney, a for all intents and purposes, an admired man, and his reputation over the years has taken some hits, and you know it's kind of part of the whole uh, uh, woke movement of of looking on these figures from the past and kind of reanalyzing you know were they good or not and you know there's a sense of of it's kind of a growing what's the anti-capitalist kind of sentiment and you know that's that's kind of the zeitgeist right now so i mean is, is that all that's going on here is that that's a representation of a little piece of disney that we can actually turn into effigy uh we meaning you know the the general public i um is that all that's going on here or is there more to it? Cause like, I, I don't find steamboat Willie that, that Mickey, I don't find him a particularly compelling or interesting character. No. There's not really any depth to it. I mean, it's, there's, there's nothing there. So I have to think that it's what Mickey mouse is a representation of is what we're really, there's some hunger to kind of tar and feather that. Is that am I, I reading too much lot, into it? Or a lot of that is that because think? obviously Disney do control their characters very tightly, and now they can't control the very first incarnation of Mickey Mouse. So people want to have fun with that and say, well, uh, you know, now you can't have this, so we can play around with it and you know do, do it like. Obviously, you can't use the the more modern colored version of Mickey Mouse. Eventually, that's going to happen too. Um, because Disney did try and lobby the copyright laws to change so that it, to make expand the uh the length of copyright so that they wouldn't lose steam but Willie, but uh, eventually they said no, you have to let it go. Um, and so they're kind of forced to let it go, and then people just want to have fun at the expense of Disney because you've got this huge international corporation that uh, there are obviously lots of fans of it, and then there are lots of people who find some of the things they've done very questionable and then there's people who are so in between and you know you've got that and you can poke fun at it because they've lost control of their most iconic character at least but the first incarnation of it so i think it is it, a lot of it is that because you look at some of the other stuff that was released on copyright and no one's making fun of that uh this year right that's that's the thing is is this is not this is not a regular tradition of how to treat stuff that falls into the public domain yeah. And it doesn't, and 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 don't get me wrong. I don't think that anything that falls into the public the public domain that it inherently deserves to be like treated with some sort of special reverence or anything like that. I'm not saying that, but it's just interesting that the, the level of ire that is directed towards this character and and you know the the company that it represents, or or maybe even the person, you know, the <laughs> man that 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 is, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, I, and I guess because I don't have, I don't love every decision Disney's made for sure. I don't have any particular warmth 
that I feel towards them. I mean, I guess if I if I think about my childhood watching the wonderful world of Disney with Walt himself coming out and introducing and then they do the movie and whatever. I mean, my gosh, how can you not just gush about that, you know? And I guess I've just never really felt invested enough in, you know, gosh darn it, Walt Disney better really be a very nice guy in every way or I'm going to feel betrayed here. No, I don't care, you know? I mean, everybody's got their skeletons and, and and nobody's perfect you know so uh and there are certainly worse humans than walt disney you know there are worse people who have lived there are certainly better but there are definitely worse so yeah i just don't i don't know i, I feel like that there's that there's got to be more to it than that and because i'm not personally invested in that uh movement or whatever I think that I, I think you're right. I think there might well be more to it, but I but I think possibly you might you might not need to consider more than what Disney is doing right now, which is you know if you think about it, it has a platform and a channel, and it's an add on <laughs> to all the other channels that you've got, and you pay for it, and. You know, you have a load of content on it and it's all sorts of well, whatever whatever the whatever the content is, but but it's very much one of the things that will be going out of people's wage packets every single month if they're you know, if they're paying a subscription to it. So the fact that they then can get to play legitimately with something that would have been core to that brand, um, is perhaps just a little dig at what Disney has become and how people feel about it. And um, you know, I think I think what you've got here is a is a is a cultural kickback um targeting the company, not the man. I don't get it the sense of it being the man. I think you've got a bit more going on in relation to how people feel about the 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 corporate entity. And how it's um, controlling content generally. Um, that would be my gut feel on this. Um, yeah, I guess really, you know, the reason we yeah, because it's of... interesting. I, I, I grew up in the era. I, I grew up in the era where when the Disney Channel came to cable television. Like I, I, I am old enough. <laughs> to, to be where I remember there was cable TV. And then after that, the, the Disney channel came around and it was a paid add on. Yeah. When it first came around, it wasn't part of package. It was an individual channel you could subscribe to and add it to your cable package. And there wasn't, there wasn't this kind of reaction to that. I think the reaction was, if you don't want it, then don't get it, you know? And and to some degree, I, I feel like that that kind of should be the reaction to Disney Plus, right? I mean, if you don't, you don't have to do it. It's not a tax. You know, if you don't want it, then just don't, just don't pay for it. Don't subscribe it. But coupled with this sense of entitlement, I should be able to watch Star Wars and Marvel movies whenever I want to. That's new. Nobody's ever thought that prior to Napster, for example. Yeah. And I think that actually Napster, which kind of blew open the whole music industry and all this music was just freely available. You didn't have to pay for it. No accountability, no cost, no nothing. Just boom, it's out there. And it happened so fast that the music industry had no idea. They were totally caught on their heels. They didn't know what to do about it. Yeah. And I feel like that that. It was either a consequence of a new entitlement mentality or it bred sense itself it bred that new sense of this new attitude about digital content frankly machinima grew up in in under the same shadow of that okay. there was kind of a presumption uh, a seemingly harmless one but a presumption of when well, we got this video game why legal departments at the gaming companies are like well uh, you know not everything 
that's been the conversation all along. So, you know, I guess, I mean, my, my, my hobby is, is, has, has grown in the same ground in the same earth, right under that same tree, you know? So I, I guess I get it, but it's just this same thing has happened before the pay for it channel to get Disney content. You can't watch anywhere else. And immediately Disney stopped making that stuff available. They stopped doing the Sunday night movies as much on the regular, you know, main channels. And now that's just on Disney. And if you want to watch the old cartoons, now that's just on the Disney channel. This yeah. all happened before. And I don't know, there wasn't this kind of reaction or maybe the internet wasn't there. So you didn't have a way to find out how many people in the world felt the same way as it's, you about it. I don't know. There's a lot of elements to it. But what Disney have done since then as well, because at the time they only released Disney content. Since then they bought Marvel and they bought Lucasfilm mm -hmm. and they bought uh, 20th Century Fox. So suddenly they've got all the Marvel, they got access to all the Marvel characters and they produce a lot of films and TV shows the star wars fans can be quite vocal in what they like and don't like um <laughs> really yeah um and then of course 20th century fox i don't think anyone was too upset that Disney bought that but suddenly they've got all of the 20th century fox films and tv shows which you know that you've got alien and predator buffy the vampire slayer um <laughs> die hard um you know all these all this content, which they immediately put onto uh, Disney Plus or onto Hulu for some of the more adult stuff. Um, and I think there's this image that Disney just wants to own everything. So mm -hmm. by losing control of Mickey Mouse, their most iconic character, people feel like they've something, Disney has lost something and they can kind of poke fun at this giant that is trying to claim everything, um, all their entertainment. Okay. Now, I can for buy a lot that. of the stuff, yeah, yeah, for a lot of the stuff that um, 20th Century Fox have obviously they own it now and put it on Disney Plus, they're not touching it other than making it available. Yeah. So it doesn't really affect a lot of these films. But when they try and continue or remake um things that have finished, you know, fans of that aren't sure if they're gonna like this new content or not. Because mm -hmm. they've got a new um alien yeah. movie coming out sometime. Well, I think I think people that have criticisms of how the IP is being used while they have very strong opinions. I do think they're in the fast minority. Um, yeah. You know, the, the, people who have very strong opinions about what should be done with Marvel's property or what should be done with star Wars. Clearly they, the fan base has very strong opinions about what Disney has done with that, but that doesn't represent, I think a sizable portion of compared to the overall market. And, and I guess part of what I wrestle with is, okay, given that streaming is here, somebody would be doing this with the Marvel movies, with the Star Wars movies. Somebody would be doing it. If it wasn't Disney, then it would just be Star Wars. Lucas would just do it. Yeah. Or Marvel yeah. would just do it. And then you'd have to subscribe to yet more channels. So part of me pushes back against this notion of, well, that's what it is, is this, the fact that that stuff's on streaming. The truth is it would be on streaming. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, there would be more uproar if it wasn't at this point. You know, if everything else in the world was on streaming, but Star Wars, you still had to go buy Blu-rays, people would be pissed. Yeah. They, they demand, you know. So, yeah, it's, I don't know, there's a particular ire with Disney, and it's it's wider. I, I'm aware of the criticisms of, let's say, what Disney has done, the decisions they've made, and how to continue George Lucas's legacy and the Star Wars story and the universe and stuff. Yeah, there's a lot of people who think that they could do that better. Most of them are incorrect on that, <laughs> but there's a lot of people who feel that way. Okay, I get it. I totally get it. But the level of ire uh, against the Disney brand is, there's more to it than just those people. And I, I, I guess I'm just really puzzling over what that comes from and how quickly that has changed mm. that was, you know you, disney was loved the, the disney brand was was loved particularly in america uh the, if you when you get near orlando they've got a uh 
one of the big high voltage power line towers that the wires go through, you know, that's mm -hmm. shaped yeah. like the Mickey Mouse ears. And you <laughs> see that from any direction when you're coming to Orlando to go to Disney. And as a kid, you're excited. And even as the parents, you're excited. And I mean, that wasn't that long ago. Cool. And now, you know, the governor of Florida and 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 the Disney company are arguing about textbooks in schools and taking away tax benefits. And I mean, it's just become this whole other thing. Mm -hmm. And it happens so fast. Um, it, it, I mean, relatively speaking, it's been very fast that this this turn of not just that people are ready to turn Steamboat Willie into a bloody savage. Uh, that that's the idea they get when they have public domain access to to him is let's make him kill people. Let's make him really scary. But the fact that there's an audience for it, like a, a audience is just ready to. Yeah, let's watch that. Let's see that. Mm. It's perplexing to me. Um, and I don't I don't know if we're necessarily going to come up with the answer. No, I don't talk about will. it, but I just I, I did. I did want to mention it. It's really interesting. Uh, it's intriguing it, because I, I think it's definitely something worth following. Um, because it's another form of community action, really, which is yeah, you know, the, you know, like like the machinima guys have always been the ones to take action, um, and you know, and put stuff out there and garner an opinion around stuff. Well, we're we're seeing a little bit more than machinima creators doing stuff. Really, we're seeing professionals doing it. I think, <laughs> uh, but people yeah. people yeah. trying to um, figure out how they how they make a point and what that point will be. I, you know, we're not going to know, I think for maybe four or five years on what the impact of this will be on brand Disney, but I do think there will be an impact. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> I think it's when they lose the more modern versions of the character. That's when, that's when they'll feel a bigger impact because um, that's what people, that's what children and people think about is the, the modern day Mickey Mouse, the full colored one. People are aware of the Steamboat Willie one, but that, when you think when you talk about Mickey Mouse, that's not what instantly comes to mind. Mm -hmm. It's it's the modern take on him that. Now, when they start losing that, and I, when I say modern, he's had that design for quite a long time, so uh, that is going to run out sooner or later for the copyright, and it'll be sooner rather than later. I don't know the exact date of when he had that design, but it's, that's coming. And that's sure. when they'll feel a sure. big impact. Um, Damien, mean, what news you got this week? Um, <laughs> well, it's, it's two things that I was going to talk about. One actually came out. This is going to be so fun to edit. Can recording. I just say, this is going to be so fun to edit. Oh my god! Sorry. Good. <laughs> that's <laughs> all right. right. So this, this, it, it, I say news, but it came out a few days after our last recording, so it's not that new anymore. But it's one. I just wanted to mention because we've been talking about AI and following that um, for a while. And this is um, a case of AI misuse. And it's not directly related to machinima, but, you know, this AI does factor in. Um, so this is about Taylor Swift. And some people have been using AI image creators to create very adult pictures of Taylor Swift. Now, um, personally, I haven't looked at them. I don't want to know. Uh, but they were posted on various social media platforms and viewed by millions of people before they were taken down. And I imagine she's very upset by this and yeah. I don't blame her. So it's what's so that? gross. It is. There's no need for it. Um, but now Congress is looking at uh, what kind of laws and restrictions can be put on to um, AI image creation and misuse because of what happened with Taylor Swift. And this is the kind of misuse of AI that is going to cause governments around the world to legislate. And they'll probably legislate very harshly, especially when they themselves are the target of the misuse. Obviously, we've got um, the upcoming election in America this year. And again, here in the UK, I imagine AI is going to be used and misused to put uh candidates on both sides of in both elections in very bad situations and that's when they're really going to take notice of it um so yeah i don't know what's happened with this taylor swift thing since then it was just that was a big headline thing that came out 
um, a few weeks ago. Yeah, uh, I was well, the fan that. base, the fan base rallied in kind of an amazing way because like apparently when this first broke, I haven't seen him either. I have not sought them out. I don't want to see him. I have a daughter. I can't. Yeah. It's just gross. But it was really cool to read about what happened with her fan base because these were initially uh, links to these were apparently on the X platform, Twitter. Mm. And of course, for a very brief period, then that trended, which for, if you're not on attention called to it for all the other users of, of the platform, whether you want to and, see it or not. Right. Right. So the, uh, the fan base, basically, for lack of a better term for it, they hacked the algorithm by overloading Twitter with tweets that were wholesome and supportive of Taylor Swift and knocked that stuff right off the trending page. This is just a grassroots thing that just fans did. A lot of fans. Because you can't, you can't just be a person in a bot and pull that off on Twitter. It doesn't work that way. They shut it down. This word was real users uniting together and taking action on this. And next thing you know, you couldn't, you couldn't have found that on there if you looked for it. And, and that basically bought enough time to where then the admins at Twitter could track down these things and get them off the platform for real. Yeah. But in the meantime, the fan base basically stepped in human shield style and did this whole thing. It's really it's really kind of cool uh, to, and to see, see that happen, you know. So she's got millions of fans all around oh, the yeah. world, and yeah. they're all younger and going to be tech savvy, so they're all going to be on that. And Absolutely, it, yeah, you're right. That was such a really good. It thing was pretty neat how that. they rallied together like that. Uh, yeah. uh, I, I like that. It is unfortunate that, yeah, it's incidents like this and like what's inevitably going to happen in the political season. You're right, Damien. There's like no, no getting around it. Even if the official you know, politicians and their staff don't do it. Anybody can do this stuff, right? It doesn't require any special skills. No. And anything from anyone can go viral and be global in, in minutes. So yeah, it's going to happen. And you're right. That is in the same way that like, you know, a lot of the way that politicians in the late nineties learned anything at all about video games was when it was discovered that the two shooters at Columbine in the late nineties that they played the doom video game. Mm -hmm. And that was the first thing that some of these, you know, frankly, elderly uh, uh, legislators had ever heard anything about video games. And what do they hear about? Well, these guys used a, a murder simulator to practice for this. And it's like, and I mean, how do you fight against that? It's, it's like, you can't deny they're not making a, a totally illogical connection there, but there's so much more to video games than that. And there's so many bazillions of people who play these games and they don't go murder people. So logically, you can't say that it causes that. No. I mean, you know, but, people have been killing But that's each the other. whole context. That discussion is the whole context. Kind of like in the 80s, uh, Ozzy Osbourne, a lot of the way that people learned about him was that he was taken to court because uh, from a mother of a young man who committed suicide while listening to Ozzy Osbourne's song, Suicide Solution, which is not a song encouraging suicide, by the way. Uh, if, you're, if you're curious about the song, go look it up. It's not about that at all. But that's how, so that's Ozzy Osbourne, right? Or, you know, it, it's that, that's, that's rock music. It's, it's making kids kill themselves. And yeah, this is that moment for AI. This is the beginning of that moment for AI. And so, I mean, as big as it is in the news of circles we follow, we assume that everybody knows about AI, but it's a very, very, very small percentage of people that are engaged with that particular thing that even know anything about it at all. Like, I mean, they may hear the term AI and draw their conclusions, but people who have actually gone and actually engaged with the product to see how it works like we have, that's such a tiny minority. Yeah. And certainly nobody in friggin' Congress has ever done that. You know, they have no clue. So this is and their introduction. 
yeah. is Taylor Swift fake pornography or someone putting, you know, Joe Biden's head on a donkey and and or whatever, or frankly, you know, putting words in the mouth of such and such world leader. Uh, that's that's what that's what the decision makers in these countries are going to get as their first exposure to AI. It's a shame. Uh, I mean, there are elements of AI that need to be regulated, for sure. I think anybody who's ever been in the development of AI, nobody says it should be completely unregulated and just go. Even the people who are inspired by it and want to do it, they say, hey, this is really powerful. We've got to be careful with this, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm not I'm not an anarchist, you know. I, I don't think that it should be unregulated. It's just there's going to be an overcorrection now, yeah. right? Uh, uh, and and it's what's maybe the most sickening to me about it is that the people making those decisions on how to legislate this and the people creating it and all that it's all about money. I mean that's all it's about. So yeah. when they go to regulate AI. It's in terms of dollars and pounds and dinars. You know, it's it's that's it. It's just a, it's just open AI is bringing in all this money. How can we get some of it? Uh, the, um, you know, the the in the UK and in Europe, there is already um, draft legislation on this sort of stuff um, yeah. ab- about the 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 application of kind of. M- moral principles in terms of the use of of images and what they can represent and what have you. Uh, and I don't think the issue is to do with the making of the law. It's the application of the law that's the challenge because you can make the law, you know, you could make this law, you know, stand tomorrow, basically. Mm-hmm. The issue is how do you get the platforms to act upon it? And it's, it's that... Uh, you know, the propagation of content across these multiple different types of platform by, uh, you know, users that that is is the challenge. Now, some of the ways that the platforms are responding is basically to flag content to say, you know, you know, if it looks like a looks like a politician and he looks to have said something controversial or not or whatever, but whatever he said. One of the things that they're now sort of saying, if you see a little comment underneath it, is that um, this is unverified or this is verified by um, the community and is believed to be generated by AI. And you're going to see more and more of that, uh, sort yeah. of the, the way in which the content is generated. But that isn't the same as a takedown. And, and you know, how you get content off these platforms by you know, getting the companies to act is this, you know, we've we've seen these platforms try to do this for years, manage, you know, IP, manage content, manage the distribution of it, manage the way that people share it in private files on WhatsApp and what have you. There's no way that this is going to be, you're not going to do it. Absolutely not going to do it. So, so I guess what you've just said, and I haven't seen this, I have, I kind of, I guess, I was aware that there was something going on with Taylor Swift. It's not something I'm, I've been particularly um, following, to be honest. I wasn't aware that that's what the community had done. If that's what they have done, I mean, what a great example of um, act, you know, community action yes. for, for good. And how unusual that that is the case, because normally you see it go completely in the opposite direction. This stuff. That's gets. right flamed all over everywhere. And I dare say it has been too. It's just that the dominant ways that you're seeing it is is perhaps the way the algorithm has been tweaked to bring the more wholesome response to it, to the fore maybe. But you're never going to stop people behaving in this way. And no. more and more of these tools are only going to result in more and more of this type of content. And the onus sits with the platforms and with people themselves. Because if you start sharing this stuff, you're part of the problem. And, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in in my way of thinking about this, you know, this kind of how do you overcome this? There is only really one way to sort of think about it. And that is that the tools, the techniques, the technologies, they have to be taught 
to you know and and the and the moral principles that go with their use have to be taught as part of our education system has to be um because if people can't figure out how to behave in an ethical and moral way then you need to teach them how to do that uh, in, in 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 my opinion because i don't think technology is a solution here certainly the companies aren't they cannot act quickly enough communities seem to be able to act reasonably quickly but they are not the problem themselves it's others that are the problems yeah that's no that's a great point because if you were to try to fix the problem through education and you did focus on technology education will never catch up no you know but, it but won't. It, like you said if you if if the focus is put in its proper place which is kind of underlying moral principles almost a sense of like uh civics Absolutely. citizenship you know that type of thing and frankly uh there has been a in the west uh, a decided de-emphasis on that as part of absolutely of secondary education as well as liberal arts education it's it's kind of out of fashion yeah to teach ethics and civics and that kind of thing and well frankly this is kind of a result you know so yeah and it's not too late to do that it's just not going to be a pop it in the microwave and it's done kind of fix it is a long-term view um to to start fixing it where we can um there's there, certainly there are ways to to educate the adult population yeah you need but a few if good examples else, <laughs> yeah if nothing else to, to let's at least yeah get started with with kids and it doesn't have to be a religious based education at all there are universal principles that uh that people of all persuasions can agree on I mean, that's why we have a society is because there are those things absolutely that we can agree on in spite of those differences. And and it's, it's, it's yeah, it's it, a good, good it's thought to get that, back to the basics on those. It's just that we haven't thought about society as being digital right? <laughs> in the past. Because, I mean, you know, we often talk about how people behave in an absolutely appalling way in, in these platforms. I mean, some of the language is just disgraceful. Would you yeah. say that to somebody for in you know face to face? No, you wouldn't. These people are And that's actually wires. an interesting part of this is is the fact that that, that is there is no dispute about that. Mm -hmm. There is a clear line of demarcation on even you know online psychopaths that there's a there's a line they won't cross in person. Uh maybe for no other reason than if you do that you might get punched in the face. Mm -hmm. Uh but it, it, maybe that's good you know that's that's it's it is good to to temper oneself and yeah the digital realm has kind of encouraged an atmosphere where it's consequence consequence free well i could just be anonymous and just say whatever i want i can even not be anonymous and say almost whatever i want and if i'm not rich and famous the consequences aren't that bad for me you know i mean what is cancellation to joe from down the street it's nothing you know cancellation for like a prominent hollywood entertainer or a prime minister that's a big deal he has something to lose that can be you know tangibly taken away but it's not the prime minister that's on there you know mm. being a very filthy ugly person well let's hope not uh <clears throat> it, it's the average you know these are people that are just in the populace so yeah it's boy it's it's discouraging uh, in in some ways, uh, I'm reminded of kind of a. I think it's a. I think it's a, a saying with a Zen origin that you know the best time to. Uh, the best time to plant. Best time to plant a tree is 30 years ago. The second <laughs> best time to plant a tree is right now. Yeah. You know, and so there's this sense of. This is a correction that I probably won't see manifest. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Uh, this is this is something that that others are going to need to take up the torch and see it finished. It's it's uh it it does take it takes time. Yeah. Uh, and and we're up against let's say the monster that the the dragon that St. George is facing here is 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 technology which does not slow down. Uh, it, it keeps moving. It keeps 
adding to the challenge. So, yeah, it's not an enviable task, but it is, it's a necessary one. Yeah. Or, or frankly, this tech will do us in. You know, it. I really do. I hate to overstate it. I don't think that is overstating it. Uh, I think that there's a there's a rot that can set in if this doesn't get addressed and spoil the whole barrel, so to speak. You know what? I'm sure the first person to actually create fire said exactly the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> that is probably true. Yeah. Except it just sounded like they only had like three syllables then. So it just was <laughs> ooga booga booga. <laughs> right. Yeah. Damien, did you have anything else for us? Yeah, it's something a bit more cheerful than what we just were talking about. Ah, good. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, last month we were talking about the uh, iClone Crowd simulation, the new update for the Crowd simulation. And I hadn't actually tried it at that point, but I have now. Um, so I can talk about it a little bit more. And it's very impressive, this update. Now, they had Crowd simulation, with ge Crowd generation before. And it was kind of limited on what you could do. Like you could set a space aside, and it would, you could put some characters in it, and they, they'd walk around. Um, and there's a bit more to it than that, but that was kind of the extent of it. Now, you still have that option, but it's a lot more advanced. So you can you place a, uh, a it's not really a square. But you select a piece of ground, and it'll. This is where a crowd can be placed. But it's smart enough to detect where objects and other characters you've already placed are. So it makes little holes around them. So you won't get someone spawning inside, you know, an arm sticking out of a wall or anything like that. Or, you know, inside another character. And when they start moving around, they will avoid those other objects. Uh, which I thought was very impressive. Yeah. Um, there's another mode to it where you can create a path and you can set the width of it. So you can have a really tight path where you can have a, a wide one. And what will happen is it'll place characters on that path and they will move along it. And if you set a wide one, they're not going to be following it on a very tight. They'll they'll be spread out, which is good. And you've, you've got a city street, for example. Uh, you set the path to be as wide as the street and then you've got your characters will um, follow the street, but they won't bump in. Oh, yeah, they're smart enough as well to not bump into each other or, or anything else that they detect in front of them. So, you know, if, if you've got a lamppost, they won't walk into it. They'll walk around it or, you know, a bench or a tree or something like that. Which Such I, a huge time saver. Yeah. My goodness. And it gets better than that because you could also take any of the animations you've got in your animation library and you can drop them in. And so it will choose from those and you could tag them as you want. So the obvious one be male and female. So uh you wouldn't necessarily well maybe you would but um let's say you got um one of your character models has got high heeled shoes and you've got a specific animation walk for someone wearing high heels you put the appropriate tags for that character and for that animation uh and you, you know it's just a drop down box so you can do it in a second it, you don't wow. have to do anything um and then it's a similar thing with the the character models that you select you it, there's a little box and you can drag in the character models that you want um it to generate and so you know you, you bring in your crowd you can do whatever you like but there's also an option so let's say you got a character model with a blue shirt you can enable the clothing variant option so you may get multiple characters that the same model but if you've got versions of that shirt in different colors you'll get random they'll it'll randomly pick from those colors so you're not getting identical characters walking along they'll be you know, wearing different color clothing, even if it's the same model itself. And this is all something you can do so incredibly quickly. Uh, and I created a crowd scene. I, I think I watched the tutorial on the, the Real Edition page, uh, YouTube channel. It was about seven minutes long. Um, I watched through it twice. Uh, and then I had, within minutes, I had populated a crowded marketplace with alien characters. And they're all doing different, uh, some were walking around, some were talking from the animations I brought into the selection and the aliens were you know, all different from the my alien collection just to you know so then all look identical and they was ready to go in less than 10 minutes wow and it's actually quicker than that now because most of that 10 minutes was just playing around with the settings to see what they could do once you know what you're doing you can do it in a lot, a lot less time than that so it is an incredibly powerful crowd simulation tool 
Uh, I'm really glad that they've done it because I'm going to make good use of it. Amazing. Yeah. So awesome. yeah, that's that's my coverage of that um, for this month. Uh, yeah, it's definitely worth exploring if you've got some busy scenes. And the other thing I noticed is, even though you're seeing multiple copies of the same character, somehow it's only processing one model of that. Like if you've got multiple versions of a character appearing, it'll only process one. So you're not getting a huge memory draw that if you placed yourself you know 20 copies of the same character i don't oh, know wow. how that possibly could work but it does because it's a little memory usage thing in the top corner <gasps> and it doesn't go up i, I saw i saw warlord uh he he showed a demonstration of this uh new feature and it was a, it was basically a star wars hoth scene and they, he had stormtroopers spread like all over this large area and all of them marching and I, I think I remember him mentioning something about the efficiency, but he didn't, he didn't, I didn't listen to him enough to get, get the detail of that, uh, that you just mentioned. That must be how, how they make it manageable. Yeah. Cause if you, if you were to yeah. do that loading up individual models, yeah, you'd eat up your resources pretty quick for sure. What yeah. a neat. So that's, yeah, so that stormtrooper scene you're talking about, I don't know how many stormtroopers there, but I don't know, let's say 20 or 30, it would only actually be processing one. Even if the animation is different as well. I don't know how it does it. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. And this is something that's built into iClone 8. Is that correct? It's not yeah. a not a paid add-on. Yeah, it's completely free. Wow. Obviously, you need to pay for the content that you bring in, like the animations and the characters. But the actual add-on itself, that's free. And oh, there's, no, cool. there's no pro version as well. It, it's all, all included. Nice. Yeah. Mm. Well, that's that's all I've got for uh, this month, but uh, I'm very happy with that last one. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks for joining us, everyone, and thank you, Damien and Tracy. And uh, we will uh, we would love to hear your feedback on any of these items. So uh, you can do that in the comment section if you're watching this on YouTube, or in the comment section of wherever you did see this posted. Um, I think Tracy, don't you syndicate over to LinkedIn? And I know we we put it out on Facebook as well. So yes. comment where you are. We eventually go around and corral them all up and review them together. So feel free to do that or drop us an email at talk at completely machinima.com. So uh, again, thanks for joining us and we'll look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Thank you. Bye. Bye.